Hello, and welcome to the first lecture of Statistics and Probability. So, we are going to be covering Chapter 1 today. Um, if you haven't seen the guided notes already, they are posted in the module, so go ahead and take a look at those. Um, so if you look at the front cover page, it's going to look like this. Okay, so we're heading down to Chapter 1. And we're going to start talking about sampling and data. So this chapter is focused a lot on terminology. It's very terminology heavy. Um, we'll have a little bit of numbers um, floating around in here, but it's going to be mostly a lot of terms, a lot of notation, things that you're just going to need to start remembering um, for when we need them later, when we're actually running our own tests and things like that. So. Starting off, section 1.1, so definitions of statistics, probability, and key terms. So statistics is the science of collecting, organizing, analyzing, and interpreting data in order to make decisions. Uh, organizing and summarizing data is called descriptive statistics. And the formal methods for drawing conclusions from, da oh, from data are called inferential statistics. Okay, so the difference being descriptive statistics, um, quite as they say, they describe uh, the data that we've already seen. Okay, so organizing and summarizing that data, whereas inferential statistics makes inferences, it infers conclusions. Okay, so descriptive is talking about what we already have, the data, and inferential is using that to then try to draw some conclusions from it. So the, no, the goal of statistics is to gain an understanding of the data. The calculations are done using technology, but the understanding comes from the researcher. If we can grasp the basics of statistics, we are confident in the meaningful st statistical conclusions we make. So a lot of the kind of the hard part of the statistics is done using the technology, but uh, we still need to be able to draw appropriate conclusions from that or else it doesn't really mean anything. Okay, so here's an example. A popular program boasted remarkable reading achievement called Your Baby Can Read, which promises that the, with the use of flashcards, DVDs, pop-up books, and some quality time between parent and child, almost any preschooler could learn to read before they even entered kindergarten. Does this mean all parents should buy and use this program? Well, not necessarily, right? Uh, and that the key word there would be, would be all. Right, we want to be careful um, saying all parents should buy and use this program um, because everybody's different. Right? And that's going to be one thing that comes up a lot in these uh, sections and statistics is that there is no one-size-fits-all for everything. Um, there is a lot of um, gray area when it comes to dealing with statistics. It's never going to be 100% you know, yes or 100% no. There's always going to be some give and take there. Um, one of the things that we use to study this quote-unquote give and take is probability. So probability is a mathematical tool used to study randomness. It deals with the chance or the likelihood of an event occurring. And we're going to study a lot about probabilities this semester, um, but we're looking at what is, it, what is the likelihood that something would occur, right, given any information that we have. So uh, here are a couple ways of uh, using probabilities as predictions. So to predict the likelihood of, of an earthquake or rain, or whether you'll get an A in this course, we use probabilities. Doctors use them to determine the chance of a vaccination causing the disease the vaccination is supposed to prevent. Um, all kinds of things that we use probabilities for, and then we have to ask ourselves the question, am I okay with that chance or that likelihood? Okay. So here's some key terms that you need to know. Um, just because you'll hear me referring to them throughout the semester. Um, so a population is a collection of persons, things, or objects under a study. Okay, so a population is just the entire group of objects or people. A parameter is a number that is a property of the population. So the parameter is a number that de uh, describes the population. A sample is a subset of the population, and we study the sample to gain information about the population. So if we were running a test on, you know, the entire population of the United States, there's no way that we can, you know, ask 
questions and poll every single person in the United States. What we would do is we would get a sample. We'd get a smaller group, smaller subset, ask them the questions, and then use that to help make uh, generalizations about the entire population. Okay? A statistic is a number that represents a property of the sample. So there's an important distinction between these two. So the parameter talks about the population, whereas the statistic talks about the sample. So you can remember that alliteration, population, parameter, sample, statistic. Okay. And then a variable notated by the capital letters such as X uh, is a characteristic of interest for each subject in a population. So generally the variable is what we're studying. We want to know something more about the variable. Okay. So in this example, determine whether the given is a parameter or a statistic List the respective sample or population, then identify the variable denoted by x. All right, so suppose the percentage of all students on your campus that have a job is 84.9%. So the first question, uh, is this involving a population or a sample? So as with all of these, obviously you can't talk back to me right now, um, but I do want you to think about it, okay? Think about what your answer would be and why. Um, and then, of course, I tell you the answer and make sure that that lines up with what you're thinking. Um, so suppose the percentage of all students on your campus that have a job is 84.9%. So in this case, we're talking about all the students on your campus. That is a population. Okay. If we were looking at, you know, a subset of that, like, you know, one class out of the entire campus, that would be a sample. But this is the entire population, which means that the value is going to be a parameter. And our variable x that we're studying is we're looking at the percentage of students that have a job. So that's going to be our variable. Our variable is job status. All right, And then part B, suppose a sample of 250 students is obtained, and from this sample we find that 86.4% have a job. Well, hopefully this one's a little more clear, which it is. This one is a sample, and we are told that, right? Which means that the data we get from it represents a statistic, not a parameter. And the variable in this case is still job status. Okay, that hasn't changed just because we're looking at a sample instead of a population. That variable has not changed. All right. So now while we're talking about variables, we need to look at some different classifications of variables. So we have a couple different types of variables. We have what are called qualitative or categorical variables. And then we also have quantitative or numerical variables. Okay, so qualitative, so that's these up here, qualitative or categorical variables uh, classify based on attributes or characteristics, uh, whereas quantitative variable, like quantitative, like a quantity, okay, or numerical variables are numerical measurements. Okay, so that one, a little more straightforward if it's numerical. Um, so let's look at some examples and determine whether these variables are categorical or numerical, right? Qualitative or quantitative. So a researcher studied factors that affect the eating habits of adults in their mid-30s. Classify each of the following variables considered in the study as categorical or numerical. All right. So nationality. So nationality, uh, is that numerical? Not really. So this one would be categorical. Uh, number of children. Keyword, number. So this one is numerical. Level of education. So 
you might think, because you kind of have like a pecking order in your head, right? You As the level of education increases, right? You get like high school diploma, you get um, associates, bachelors, masters, and so on and so forth. Um, but those are not numerical classifications. Those are categorical. Okay, household income in the previous year. Uh, so income, that's a dollar amount, so this one is numerical. Okay, uh, zip codes. Now zip codes, this is an interesting one, right? Because zip codes are numbers, right? Um, so you've got, you know, whatever your zip code might be is a string of five numbers. Okay, but when we're looking at zip codes, when we're studying them, the number itself is not treated numerically, right? And if you look back at the definition here, it's er uh, arithmetic operations are performed on these values. We don't add zip codes together, right? We don't divide by a zip code. A zip code is actually just telling us where something is, right? If you were to take the entire, you know, like Orange County and divide it up by zip code, it would give you different regions. So zip codes, even though they are numbers, zip codes are actually categorical. Because what they symbolize is a region, a location, not something numerical. Okay. And then the last one, uh, daily intake of whole grains measured in grams per day. That one would be numerical. Right? That's an amount that, of uh, whole grains that you take in. All right. I <clears throat> uh, have another definition here, just defining data. So data are the actual values of the variable. They may be numbers or they may be words. Uh, if you're looking for the single term of data, it's datum. Um, so, but the data are the actual values that we get when we're running our experiment. Okay. Uh, so for this example, determine the data of the scenario. We want to know the average or mean amount of money first-year college students spend at San Jacinto College on school supplies that do not include books. We randomly survey a hundred first-year students at the college. Three of those students spent $150, $200, and $225 respectively. So <clears throat> the data here Right? These are the actual values of the variable. So the variable that we're looking at is the amount of money that is spent. And the data we collected from these three students gives us those three dollar amounts. So we have $150, $200, and $225. Spent. Okay, so those would be our data points in this scenario. All right. So this brings us to section 1.2. So data sampling and variation in data and sampling. So we're going to look first at uh, different types of quantitative variables or numerical variables because um, we can further classify these. So when you're dealing with a quantitative variable, you have two different types, a discrete variable and a continuous variable. Discrete variable is finite or countable. Okay? Countable means counting the natural numbers, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Okay? Continuous variables, however, have an infinite but not countable number of possibilities. So oftentimes that would be like measurements. Okay, so uh, well, let's look at some examples down here. So classify each of the following quantitative variables considered in the study as discrete or continuous. Okay, so for part A, number of children. So this one, uh, if we were going to consider it continuous, I don't know how that would work because, you know, you can't have, you know, 2.5 children, right? Or, you know, 2.36942, you know, some crazy decimal like that. This does not exist on like a spectrum, right? It's not some continuous value. You either have zero children, one, chil one child, two children, three, four, five, etc. 
So number of children, that's going to be discrete. Household income in the previous year. So this one, this one's a bit of a, a, I guess you could call it a gray area. You could make an argument for both sides of this, um, where it's discrete because we can count it, right? You can count the money to the nearest cent. But when we're talking about money, generally we are dealing with a continuous variable um, because it's not rounded to the whole dollar, right? It would be $1, $2, $3. You can have cents in there as well. So we generally consider this to be continuous. And then your daily intake of whole grains measured in grams per day. So this one is a measurement, and you can see that right there. Uh, this one is going to be continuous. And if you think about it, you think, well, but I can count the number of grams that I take, right, in whole grains. You say, well, I had, you know, five grams of whole grains. Well, but did you have exactly five grams of whole grains, right? Even if we're measuring something, right, you've got a, like a container and it's got whatever substance it is in there. Even if it has a measurement on it, you know, say five grams, just because it matches up on that measurement does not mean it's exactly five grams, okay? Um, it could be, you know, 5.000001 grams. And that would not, you know, we would round it in our heads, but um, the actual value itself exists continually, right? It doesn't go from five grams up to six grams, right? It could be anywhere between five and six. So we consider this measurement to be continuous. All right. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, qualitative data, um, we don't have to worry about this additional distinction, but this kind of gives us our full breakdown of the data. So we have qualitative and quantitative, and quantitative can be broken down into discrete and continuous. Okay, so let's look at this example here. So you go to the supermarket and you purchase three cans of soup, and it's got 19 ounces of tomato bisque, 14.1 ounces lentil, 19 ounces of Italian wedding, uh, two packages of nuts, four different kinds of vegetable, two desserts, name, data sets that are quantitative, discrete, quantitative, continuous, and qualitative. So, let me break this down here. So, quantitative and qualitative. And then discrete and continuous. Okay, so qualitative, and go ahead and I'll do this in blue. So qualitative is descriptive, okay? So for example, when we're classifying uh, the nuts, that we're using. We used walnuts and peanuts. That's not quantitative. It doesn't tell us how many there were. Um, it tells us what kind of nuts, right? So types of nuts. That would be quant uh, qualitative. Uh, we have four different kinds of vegetables, right? Broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, and carrots. So those are, again, qualitative, so types of veggies. Okay, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so anything that labels like that, we would consider qualitative. So now for quantitative, so let's look at discrete. 
So anything that would be considered discrete, we would have... Uh, we can look at the quantity of packages. So we got three cans of soup, two packages of nuts, four kinds of veggies, two desserts. Right? So that's not taking into account any measurements, anything like that. We're just looking at how many containers did we buy. Right? We didn't buy half a container. We bought three cans of soup. We bought two packages of nuts, etc. So this would be the number of soup cans, uh, nuts, uh, veggies, desserts, etc. And then for continuous, these are going to be measurements. So in the soup cans, right, the tomato bisque has 19 ounces, the lentil is 14.1, the Italian has 19, right, the desserts have 16 ounces of pistachio ice cream, 32 ounces of chocolate chip cookies. Those, even though they might be you know, near those amounts, we don't have a guarantee that it's exactly that amount, right? To the nearest decimal place, we would round it. But this would be, right, the number of ounces of soup and desserts. All right, so that would give us our qualitative and our quantitative uh, data there, both discrete and continuous for the quantitative. So hopefully that's becoming kind of clear um, how we're classifying these. When we're talking about qualitative data, um, we have different ways of organizing this data. One of the, one of the good ways are uh, tables, of course. Um, but we really like to use, when it comes to qualitative data, we like pie charts and bar graphs. Uh, the reason we can use these are because it's not dealing in numerical values with quantitative data, right? It doesn't tell us, you know like number of ounces, that kind of thing, like those measurements, but it does give us what portion of the qualitative data is broken up by. So, for example, in this one down here, here we have a pie chart where we're breaking down the uh, amount of full-time versus part-time faculty for De Anza College versus Foothill College. So, the, this is qualitative data because we are breaking it down by full-time and part-time. Those are classifications, right? And these are just the counts, right? How many full-time, how many part-time? And the pie chart allows us to get a visual representation of these numbers. So I can tell you, right, if I just told you my raw data and I said, well, this one had, you know, 9,200 full-time, 13,000 part-time, and then et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's all well and good, but one of the things that we really want to focus on is being able to represent data clearly okay, in order to help make it more understandable. So you have to go into it with the assumption that people aren't going to understand reading a table like this. We want to make it as easy for them to visualize as possible. So in this case, we can see when I show you this in a pie chart, it becomes much more clear that De Anza College has a higher portion, a higher percentage of full-time than Foothill College does, right? Much smaller portion over there. So pie charts are a great way to be able to visualize qualitative data. Uh, another way is a bar graph. So this allows you to compare relative size of categories with categorical data. So like this. 
This is the same data as the pie chart, but again, it allows you to compare not only to compare you know, full-time versus part-time, but I can compare full-time versus full-time at the different schools, right? So it gives you a lot of different ways to read and interpret that data. So pie charts, bar graphs are both really good for dealing with qualitative data, right, or categorical data. All right, now we get to sampling. So uh, when we're dealing with these uh, experiments, right, these tests that we run, uh, we need to have efficient ways of sampling our uh, subjects. So uh, the most effective way is using what we call random sampling. We're going to look at a lot of different types of sampling uh, throughout this chapter, throughout this course, um, but random sampling is really what it all comes down to. Your sampling process has to be random uh, in order for it to be valid, right? If it's not random, if you just go and pick and choose the particular people you want to talk to, uh, that's not going to make for accurate or reliable data, okay? So here we have in the second paragraph, so a sample size n from a population of size capital N is obtained through simple random sampling if every possible sample of size n has an equally likely chance of occurring. The sample is then called a simple random sample. Okay, so basically, I have a population, so let me just use hypothetical numbers. I have a population of size 100, and I'm grabbing samples of 10 people out of the 100. Okay, if I do that, then every sample of 10 people has an equally likely chance of occurring, right? I'm not more likely to pick certain people over others. Right, they all have to be equally likely. Then that is a valid simple random sample. Okay, so simple random sampling requires that we have a list of all the individuals within a population. This list is called a frame. So the frame is just the list of all individuals in the sample. Uh, excuse me, within the population. If we don't have a frame, then we need a different sampling method. And we'll talk more about those. Suppose a study group consists of five students. So we have Bob, Patricia, Mike, Jan, and Maria. Two of the students must go to the board to demonstrate a homework problem. List all possible samples of size 2 without replacement, meaning an individual who is selected is removed from the population and cannot be chosen again. So I've got five students. I want two of them to go up to the board for a homework problem. And I need to find out how many different ways I could pick two people to do this task, okay, without replacement, meaning if I pick Bob to go up to the board, the second student can't also be Bob, okay, so let me go ahead and start listing these out, so let me do all the ones with Bob in it first, and you can do these too if you want to like pause it and try it yourself, that's good too, so Bob and Patricia, okay, or it could be Bob and Mike could be Bob and Jan or it could be Bob and Maria so those are all the possible cases where Bob is in it or we could have Patricia and Mike we could have Patricia and Jan. And we could have Patricia and Maria. Okay, that covers all the cases with Patricia in it. Or it could be Mike and Jan. Or it could be Mike, oops, Mike and Maria. Or it could be the last case where it's Jan and Maria. These are all the possible ways that I could send two students of the five up to the board. And let's count these up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there are ten possible ways 
for me to send these students up to the board. Okay, so that's the list of all possible samples of size 2. Okay, and of course, if it was a sample of size 3 or more, then it would be different. Okay, we'd get a different number there. So when it comes to obtaining a simple random sample, we have a couple of steps. Step one, list all the individuals in the population of interest, number them in the frame, 1 through n, and then step two, use a random number table, graphing calculator, or statistical software to randomly generate n numbers, where n is the desired sample size. Okay, so we number up everybody, and then we use some form of randomization to determine which ones we're choosing. Okay, um, so for us, um, we could use a random number table. They have some of those. You can find them online, but in the book, too. Um, a calculator can do it. Um, or statistical software can do it. Um, so, uh, you'll find generally in these notes, um, they give you the steps for a TI-8384. Um, you don't have to use that, so I'm not going to be using that this semester. Um, typically, the pieces of technology that I use throughout the semester, I'm going to pre predominantly be relying on Desmos. So we're going to use that a lot. Um, but we'll also sometimes use Excel as well, um, but primarily Desmos is what you're going to want to use. Okay? And that's just a free online software. All right. So we wish to select a random sample of three out of a group of 30 students. So in this case, um, I would actually recommend using Excel for this one. Um, if you were to use Excel, um, this is the function you would need to use. You'd type equals and then rand between okay so like random between rand between and it's 1 comma 30 that would produ produce a random number from 1 to 30 and just do that three times okay, do that three times that gives you three students right it gives you their number and then you can you know match their name to that number um, you could also use a random number table to do this right so or random number table but so often the technology is going to make the work so much easier so all right now here's a bunch more terms for you I know we're throwing a lot at you here um, so but here we have a bunch of other sampling methods that we can use so we're gonna go through these in turn so stratified sampling this is where a population is divided into a number of subgroups, or strata. Random samples are then taken from each subgroup, with sample sizes proportional to the size of the subgroup in the population. Okay, so we're breaking it up into subgroups, and then take a sample from each subgroup, with the sample size proportional to the size of the subgroup. So if the subgroup is, you know, half the population, then we need a pretty big sample from that group. Whereas if the sample is only, you know, like 2% of the whole population, then you want a smaller sample out of that. Then we have quota sampling. Uh, this is just like stratified sampling, wherein samples are collected in each subgroup until the desired quota is met. Okay, so this is stratified with a quota. Cluster sampling. Uh, this is where the population is divided into subgroups or clusters. Uh, and a set of subgroups are selected to be in the sample. So in stratified sampling, so you have the whole thing, you get it and break it into a bunch of subgroups, and then you sample within the subgroups, like that. Just grab a few out of each. That's stratified. Cluster sampling is when I break it into smaller clusters and then I select certain clusters to use. So I'm going to take this whole cluster, this one, and this one. And that's going to be my sample. Okay, so that's the main difference. Systematic sampling. Uh, every nth member of the population is selected to be in the sample. 
So here, this one sounds less random, but as long as the numbers have been assigned randomly, um, and we choose n, uh, based on how many we need in the sample, then uh, it is actually, in fact, random. Then there's convenience sampling. Um, this is not a recommended method of sampling, so convenience sampling is samples chosen by selecting whoever is convenient. Um, so this would be one where, you know, you're, a student is trying to get a sample um, representative of the entire school, but then they only talk to, you know, their few friends that they have in this one class or something. That's, that's a convenience sample, um, and that's not the best way to run samples when you're doing testing. Yeah, we want it to be truly random. Um, and then there is voluntary response sampling. So voluntary response sampling uh, is allowing the sample to volunteer. Um, this is typically how, um, especially schools, go about it, right? They want people to participate voluntarily or they'll incentivize it somehow, right? Giving away, like, gift cards, prizes, that kind of stuff. Um, but this uh, can also result in some issues uh, depending on the type of people that are responding and uh, volunteering themselves. So, um, so let's look at this example here. So in each case, indicate the sampling method. So every fourth person in the class was selected. So think about it, and hopefully when you think about it, you'd see that this is systematic. Right? Every fourth person, that's basically just the definition of systematic. Okay, part B, a sample was selected to contain 25 men and 35 women. Okay, so in this case, this would be considered stratified. Why is it stratified? Well, because we broke them up into subgroups, and we're taking a certain amount of those subgroups, right? So I'm taking some from the men group and some from the women group, and then using them as the sample. Okay, part C. Viewers of a new TV show are asked to vote via the TV show's website. Uh, this one would be voluntary, right? Because they're being asked by the TV show to go on and fill out, you know, their survey or whatever, or vote. Okay, part D, a website randomly selects 50 customers to send a satisfaction survey. So this one... Uh, this one would actually be uh, simple random. So a simple random sample. Because, you know, they're not grouping their customers, they're not, you know, putting them into clusters, and it's not, you know, a, um, a systematic sampling where it's every nth customer. Um, it is truly just... They pick 50 customers truly at random to send out the survey to. <clears throat> and then part E, to survey voters in a town, a polling company randomly selects 10 city blocks and interviews everyone who lives on those blocks. So this one is going to be cluster. Okay, because they are grouping. They're picking 10 city blocks, so 10 groups. Right. So if you go back to my, my drawing up here, Right, if you have a, a layout of the city and there's all these, you know, blocks down here on all the corners, and the city is just picking ten of them at random. Okay, so you're grouping them and then picking ten of those groups. So that would be a cluster sample. All right. Now when it comes to doing a systematic sample. Yeah, we need to be careful with how we set this up. We want to do it um, correctly, do it appropriately. So, uh, if possible, approximate the population size N, okay, capital N. Determine the same size, I think that should be sample. Determine the sample size desired, little n. Compute big N over little n, and round down to the nearest integer, this value is k. 
randomly select a number between 1 and k, call this number p. And then the sample will consist of the individuals p, p plus k, p plus 2k, etc., etc. Okay, so basically what we're doing is I'm taking the entire population, cutting it into smaller pieces, choosing one person from the smaller piece at random, and then using that to then get the person from the next group, and the next group, and the next group, etc., etc. So let's look at this example. Create a five-student sample from the class of 31 students using systematic sampling. So in this case, our population size, right, big N, is 31, and we want our sample size to be 5. So, in order to get capital N over lower N, that's going to be 31 over 5, which is 6.2. But if you recall, it wanted us to round down. So round down to the nearest integer, that's 6. That's our value of K. Alright. So that's K. And now we randomly select a number between 1 and K. So we're going to randomly choose from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It doesn't matter which one we pick. That's the whole point, is it doesn't matter. So I'm going to just try, for example, choose 4. Okay, and that's our P. So I'm going to choose 4. So what that means is I'm going to pick the fourth person on the list. Okay, so this is fourth person. Then add six each time. Okay, so I'm going to start with the fourth person on the list. Be careful, it's not person number four here, because they started at zero, not at one. So the fourth person is actually Chang. So that's four. So start with the fourth person. And then I'm going to go up six. Okay, so plus six. Then I'm going to go plus six again. So that's going to be 15, All right? So plus 6, plus 6 again, plus 6 again. And then if I try to add 6 again, well, there's, no, there's none left. So I've now selected these people. So we have here... Cheng, Zhao, Motogawa, Rokero, and Talai. And notice what we've done. We have, by randomly choosing the number 4, right, from 1 to 6, we have created a sample of size 5. This is sample size 5, which is what we wanted. All right, we wanted a sample, a 5 student sample from a class of 31 students, and that's exactly what we got. All right, so this is our process for dealing in systematic sampling. All right.
And let's look at this last page of the section here. So uh, variation in data. So variation is present in any set of data. For example, 16 ounce cans of beverage may contain more or less than 16 ounces of liquid. In one study, six 16 ounce cans were measured and produced the following amount in ounces of beverage. So we have 15.8, 16.1, 15.2, 14.8, 15.8, and 15.9. So we know that, especially with quantitative data like this, um, there is going to be variation. It's not always going to be exact. Um, and that variation is expected. Okay. Uh, so measurements of the amount of beverage uh, may vary because different people make the measurements or because the exact amount was not put into the cans. Manufacturers regularly run tests to determine if the amount falls within the desired range. Okay, so manufacturers know this is going to happen, and they just say, you know, let's try to minimize this. There's an acceptable range of ounces that are allowed within the cans. Uh, variation in samples. So the natural variation of samples is called sampling variability. This is unavoidable and expected in random sampling and in most cases not an issue. So um, the data can vary but the samples also can vary, right? Because if I am, you know, polling a sample of a hundred people about something, right, about soda preference, uh, the number of people the percentage of people that like Coke in my first sample might be different than the percentage of people that like Coke in the second sample, right? They're not going to be the same every time because they're different people, right? So this is understandable, um, and this is what happens, okay? So it's not something we can avoid. We just go with it, and the hope is that if we do enough sampling, um, it kind of evens out in the end, right? And we get a more accurate picture. So in this example, if we repeatedly take samples of a thousand people from a population of likely voters in Washington state, some of these samples might have a slightly higher percentage of Democrats or Republicans than the actual amount in the general population. Some samples might include more older people, some might include more younger people, etc. This is sampling variability. Okay? So every sample is going to be slightly different than the actual population, and that's okay. All right? If we If we could get the entire population, that would be great, but that's not usually possible. And then we have sources of bias. We always have to be mindful of potential bias in our sampling um, because that bias can potentially um, taint our study. Right? You want to make sure that we avoid it as much as possible. First off, there's sampling bias. So that's a sample that is not representative of the population. Um, I mentioned that um, convenience sampling is usually not a good thing. This is often what happens in uh, convenience samples, is you get sampling bias because the people that were chosen are not representative of the entire population. Then we have voluntary response bias. Right? If you have too many people that are volunteers to take the sample, generally you get a different kind of person that is volunteering to take these tests than a person who wouldn't want to volunteer, right? So you're going to get possibly skewed results based on the type of person that's always volunteering for surveys. There's the self-interest study. Okay? When the researchers have an interest in the outcome, that can possibly taint their results. Response bias. Okay, this is where the responder gives inaccurate responses, um, not necessarily because they're lying, but maybe just because, you know, you're you're surveying people, say about their weight, right? You're trying to gauge the average weight of a person, and the person doesn't know their exact weight, so they give you their best guess as to what their weight is, um, and that might be inaccurate. But that's you know what you have, so you just have to be mindful of that possible response bias, uh, perceived lack of anonymity. If a responder is afraid uh, that their response might have a negative impact on them, they might lie, um, right? And this would be especially true if you had people putting their names on these surveys. That's why we do them anonymously so much, um, because we don't want people to be afraid that their response could somehow affect them in a negative way. Uh, loaded questions. If the wording of a question influences the response, that's a bad thing. Um, you know, there are ways to ask questions as impartially as possible 
Or you can ask a question in such a way that you're kind of leading them to the answer you want them to give, right? So we want to avoid questions that are uh, even unintentionally trying to lead our respondents, um, our responders. So uh, we want to make sure to avoid that. And then we had response bias. Now we have non-response bias. Um, this would be where people refuse to participate in the study. So you've got, you know, you need samples of size 100, and you can only get five people to fill out your survey. Um, you can't use just the five people, because then you've got um, a problem with possible bias in your data, just not enough in that, uh, in that sample. So uh, those are some different types of response and non-response uh, bias that we can encounter and we want to try to avoid as much as possible. So, oops. All right, so that brings us to the end of section 1.2. Um, so we've still got two more sections in chapter 1, but let's go ahead and uh, pause it here for now. Um, that way you can take, take a few minutes, take a little break, um, and we'll come back in section 1.3. Um, so that'll be the next video that you guys have will be section 1.3. So I'll see you all in the next video.